Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together as we study uh, the book of Hosea and we study uh, the warnings that he gave. Let us uh, keep them in mind even to our day. And I thank you in the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. So it's interesting that we're talking about storms tonight because Hosea 8 is all about Israel reaping the storm of its sin. And that's uh, we're going to see that in verse uh, four or five, somewhere in there. But uh, we're going to start off like uh, I always do. Now, I did do one thing uh, different. I went on all the way to Hosea 9, 9, and I'll explain that in a little bit, why we did, why I included those verses. Um, but we're going to start off today with Hosea 8. To set the shofar to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord. Because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my Torah. To me, they cry, my God, we, Israel, know you. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue him. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For it is from Israel. A, I'm sorry. Go ahead. A craftsman made it. It is not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. For they shall sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads. It shall yield no flower. If it were to yield, strangers would devour it. Israel was swallowed up already there among the nations as a useless vessel, for they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up. And the king and the princess shall soon writhe because of the tribute. Because Ephraim has multiplied altars for sinning, they have become to him altars for sinning. Were I to write for him my laws by the ten thousands, they would be regarded as the strange thing. As for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meat and eat it, but the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt, for Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied for fortified cities. So I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour her strongholds. Rejoice not, O Israel, exult not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. Threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. They shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord, and their sacrifices shall not please him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. What will you do on the day appointed of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them, Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their precious things of silver, thorns shall be in their tents. The days of punishment have come, the days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool, the man of the spirit is mad. Because of your great iniquity and great hatred. The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God. Yet a fowler's snare is on his all his ways. And hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gabiah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. So the reason why we read through Hosea nine is if you remember when we first talked about the layout and gordon uh talked about this how it was divided and we looked at the unfolding faith unfolding unfaithfulness unfolding judgment 
from Hosea 4, 1 to 9, 9. Now, starting next week, we're going to start in chapter 9, and we're going to look at the unfolding hope. We're going to talk about the coming Messiah. Who is the Messiah? Gordon, uh, last week, uh, the week before last, talked about the first signs of the Messiah. But as we continue to the end of Messiah, to the end of Hosea, it lays out prophecy after prophecy about who the Messiah is and what his place is for us. So we want to keep that in mind. And basically now we're going to talk about the, the finishing judgments. And I wanted to start off with the vision, how a little bit about it. Chapter 8 through 9-9 nine, nine is a summary of Israel's sins, especially related to covenant breaking, in which those who sow the wind reap the whirlwind, right? If you sin, you're going to have a problem. But this chapter actually takes up no new theme. It is really a continuation of the sad lament and prophecy of the forthcoming destruction, which is a unique theme of the entire prophecy from Isaiah, Hosea 4 through 9, 9. Starting with chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Attention, all Israelites. God's message. God indicts the whole population. No one is faithful. No one loves. No one knows the first thing about God. All this cussing and lying and killing, theft and loose sex, sheer anarchy, one murder after another. Now, this is actually Hosea 4, uh, verses 1 through 3, but it's out of the Message Bible. And I thought it was so interesting that it was so plainly put. There is no doubt about what's going on with Hosea. You know, sometimes we look at some of those looser translations and uh, they kind of get off track. But I really think this one really puts it plain and simple what they are doing as they look at it. Continuing uh, chapter 7, verse 8, we, we step back a little bit. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. What does that mean? So Israel, the Israelites were told to set themselves aside. But instead, from being a nation set aside to accepting that which is profane and hopeless from the surrounding nations, Israel wastes and confuses itself among the Gentile nations. By not being turned at the correct time, the nation becomes composed of both believers and non-believers. What this verse here, Abraham is a cake not turned. If you looked at the old way of baking, they you, they had a hot flat surface. So you would put your bread on this surface. If you did not turn it over at the correct time, one side is going to be burnt and one side is going to be raw. And that's what we see happening, happening to the northern tribes of Israel. So there were some who were believed. Obviously, Hosea was a believer. There were other people who believed. But we also see the problem that there were many non-believers. Hosea starts with, set the shofar to your lips. Is this meant to state Hosea is to give warning to the people or to the enemies of Israel? When we think about how a, a shofar is used, it is used to announce what is coming. So maybe this is a twofold thing that that not only is Hosea to tell the people and the leaders and the priests, remember we talked about that, but also the enemies of Israel. One like a vulture, alternately it's translated as eagle. This statement here in verse 1, the eagle was a familiar Assyrian state symbol. And since Assyria was the obvious threat to Israel's sovereignty, so here it says, set the shofar, one like an eagle who is watching over us, because they have transgressed my covenant. What was the covenant that Israel transgressed? And what are the covenants? Right? A really good question is, what are they? Does anybody have any idea what, how many covenants were given in the Tanakh? Well, we'll include the New Testament. Any guess? 
Is there just one? Is there two? I always hear there's two covenants. Is that correct? No. There, it, is, it is not correct. There are more than two covenants. A covenant is everything is based on what, everything God does is based on his covenant relationship with us. The Bible speaks of seven different covenants. I could break it down into eight, but I'm not going to. Four of which, the Abrahamic, the land or Palestinian, the Mosaic and the Davidic, God made with the nation of Israel. Of those four, three are unconditional in nature. That is, regardless of Israel's obedience or disobedience, God will still fill those, fulfill those covenants. One of the covenants, the Mosaic covenant, is conditional in nature. And that is, this covenant will bring either a blessing or a cursing, depending on Israel's obedience or disobedience. Three additional covenants, the Abraham, the Adamic, uh, Noahic, and the New Covenant are made between God and mankind in general and are not li limited to the nation of Israel. And I'm going to explain all these different covenants because many people may not have heard of them or understood them. Uh, Gordon uh, speaks often about the covenant with Abraham. One man, right? There's in one man. All live and all one man all die. <clears throat> the Abraham, the Adamic covenant can be thought of in two parts. The Edenic covenant, what is part of was in Egypt, I mean in Eden, and the Adamic covenant, one of grace in Genesis 3, 16 through 19. The Edenic covenant is found in Genesis 1, 26 to 30, and it outlined man's responsibility towards creation and God's directive regarding the tree of good and evil. The Adamic covenant includes the curses pronounced against mankind for the sin of Adam and Eve, as well as God's provision for that sin from Genesis 3.15. And I'm not going to go into a great detail with this one. Gordon has done a great job of explaining how through one man all men sin and how through one man all men are saved. And that's really what that covenant is. The Noahite Noah covenant was on conditional covenant between God and Noah, specifically and humanity generally. After the flood, God promised humanity that he would never destroy life on earth with a flood. Genesis chapter 9. God gave a rainbow as a sign of the covenant, a promise that the entire world, earth, would never again flood and a reminder that God can and will judge sin. The Abrahamic covenant is outlined several places in Genesis, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, 6 and 7, 13, uh, verses 14 to 17, chapter 15, chapter 17, 1 through 14, Genesis 22, 15 through 18. In this covenant, God promises many things to Abraham. One, he personally promised that he would make Abraham's name great, Genesis 12, 2. That Abraham would have numerous physical descendants, Genesis 13, 16, and that he would be a father of a multitude of nations. This was in Genesis 17, 4 through 5. God also made promises regarding a nation called Israel. In fact, the geographical boundaries of the Abrahamic covenant are laid out on more than one occasion in the book of Genesis. In chapter 12, verse 7, 13 through Verses 14 and 15, chapter 15, 18 through 21, etc. Another prison provision of the Abrahamic covenant is that the families of the world will be blessed through the physical line of Abraham. This is a reference, of course, to the Messiah who would come from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Palestinian covenant is actually more of a land covenant. Uh, because Palestine did not exist as a country, uh, the Philistines did not live in that area. But the land covenant amplifies the land aspect that was detailed in the Abrahamic covenant. According to the terms of this co covenant, if the people disobeyed, God would cause them to be scattered around the world. But he would eventually restore the nation. Deuteronomy 30, verse 5. When the nation is restored, they will then obey him perfectly. Verse 8. And he will cause them to prosper, verse 9. And then we come to the Mosaic Covenant. 
The Mosaic Covenant is a conditional covenant that either brought God's direct blessing for obedience or God's direct cursing for disobedience upon the nation of Israel. Part of the Mosaic Covenant, obviously, was the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws, uh, the history books of the uh, Tanakh, uh, Joshua through Esther, detail how Israel succeeded in obeying the law or how Israel miserably <laughs> failed at obeying the law. Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28, deals details of blessing and cursing motif. The Davidic Covenant, given in 2 Samuel 7, 8, through 16. The Davidic covenant amplifies the seed aspect of the Abrahamic covenant. <clears throat> it promises to David in this passage are significant. God promised that David's lineage would last forever and that his kingdom would never pass away. Verse 16. Obviously, the Davidic throne has not been in place at all times. But there will be a time, however, when the someone from the line of David will again sit on the throne and rule as king. This future king is Yeshua, as illustrated in Luke 1. The New Covenant. Now, everybody says the New Covenant was only given in the New Testament, but actually, if you read Jeremiah 31, uh, 31 through 34, the New Covenant is a covenant first made with the nation of Israel and ultimately with all mankind. In the New Covenant, God promises to forgive sin and there will be universal knowledge of the Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach came to fulfill the law of Moses and to create a new covenant between God and his people. Now that we're under the new covenant, both Jews and Gentiles are going to be free of the penalty of the law. We are given the opportunity to receive the salvation as a free gift. Note it says, be free of the penalty of the law. We're not free of the law. We are still responsible to the law. But, Yeshua acts as that stop gap. Where we fall short, he covers whatever that is. When we look, continue down Hosea 8, it says, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my Torah. The Mosaic covenant was a conditional covenant that brought either God's direct blessing for obedience or God's direct cursing for disobedience upon the nation of Israel. It is over the house of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> to me they cry, my God, we, Israel, know you. Israel has forsaken the good. The enemy will shall pursue him. Where is the house of the Lord? The house of the Lord was only in Jerusalem. It was not in Samaria. <clears throat> so even though this Hosea is speaking, he is speaking not only to the northern kingdom, he's also speaking to the southern kingdom. Who is crying out to God? Right? They say, my God, we know you. Well, this has to be more than likely the tribe, the, the, the kingdom of Judah. Though there were those who also, from the northern kingdom, cried out to God. Who forsake the good? Who is the good? The good is God, right? God is the good. The people who turned away and followed a, a, a theme of idolatry turned away from God. And so here, the northern kingdom has turned away from God completely. The southern kingdom kind of hit and miss. They did some things and they did other things bad. And so their punishment was met out much later. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. If you remember, we read through that whole long line of kings. But the last king appointed was Jeroboam. And unfortunately, Jeroboam then led them into idolatry, setting up the calves with their silver and gold. They made idols for their own destruction. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. Here again, God is reminding them of setting up two calves rather than going up to the temple, to Jerusalem, to the temple. Hey, David. Yes. Um, in speaking about that, that he had, they set up kings that he um, did not. Yeah. Um, 
because we've always been told that God sets up all the kings, you know, and all, all of our rulers. Um, so what does that say to that? Well, Hosea is being very clear that people can make, God may have a person in mind, but we have free will, right? When, we, when we're looking at the kings, and we're going to talk about this a little more, we talk about the fall of morality and then the fall of politics, right? And, and Hosea really slams right into politics head on. He talks about how the, the rulers and the princes are a problem and the priests are a problem and finally the people. But it all started with a fall of morality. When the morality falls, the politics falls. And that's really what he states. So God does set up rulers, but does he set up every ruler? No, it doesn't say that he sets up every ruler, but he allows us to choose. Like in here in America, we choose who is a president. God didn't, I, I mean, I, I, I've talked about this book I have where that, that Trump is the Messiah. He's not the Messiah. Morality follows fall of politics, right? He's a classic example of that. They just had a court case yesterday about his having an affair with a hooker. And then, of course, it goes on. Morality follows politics. So when we look at that, the, God allows us a free will to choose who we want. Are well, we always picking the right person? No. Also, keep in mind that a lot of statements in the Bible, we call them sovereignty statements. In yeah. other words, God takes responsibility for it even though uh, you know he gives us our free will, like David says, but because he doesn't prevent it, he'll say that I did it. In other words, even in the Bible, it says, I created evil. Uh, is there not calamity in the city and the Lord has not done it? In other words, because God doesn't stop it, he takes, he takes responsibility. Absolutely, absolutely. I think there's another small aspect to this. And that is that when we pray and we ask God to lead us in something, he He will, like, you know, getting a leader, that he would be more active in that. But if we don't ask him and we choose a leader, it's interesting from the people that I have talked to that have been from foreign countries where there have been dictatorships and atrocities and stuff, yep. they have said, you think that Gaddafi was bad? There were blah, 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 blah people that would have been so much worse. So I think that even whether we, we do it with or without him, that he has a way of choosing people that will not be as bad as other people would be. About six million Jews, I would argue with you about that point. Well, <laughs> um, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. But there's always something that is worse than what we have experienced. There's always something. Evil, the depths of evil, I think, knows no boundaries. Absolutely. So let's continue. Hosea 8, verse 6. For it is from the Israel, a craftsman made it. It is not from God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken into pieces. And this is interesting because here in verse 6, it says the calf of Samaria. Was the calf located in Samaria? No. The golden calf was located in Bethel. Rather than Samaria, it is nevertheless referred to as the idolatry of Samaria. For from the time of Ahab, the city of Samaria was the seat of royalty from which the worship of idolatry was. So it, it, even though it was in one area, it was the whole country was being involved in it. The, so... This statement about the calf is to just how ineffective the idol was in helping you. For not only will it not protect Israel, it cannot even defend itself. Rather, it will be destroyed, not for use as an idol, but merely the value of the gold. So this verse in chapter 6, the calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. God illustrates it, and Hosea talks about that, that the calf is so not a god that is not sold as an idol is sold as simply the weight of the gold for it verse 7 continues for they sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind 
The standing grain has no heads. It has no yield, no flower. If there were no yield, strangers would devour it. And of course, we have a perfect picture of what's going on across the Midwest. Here, Jose is pointing to the futility of worshiping an idol and stating that you reap what you sow. So this is like for the first time. If you do this, you're going to get this. Not only they have no benefit from their worship, rather they will have a whirlwind upon them so that even if they manage to plant anything, it will be destroyed in the coming storm. And that's what he's telling them. Look, you keep worshiping these idols, and you're going to continue have more and more problems brought upon you. Israel is swallowed up. They are, all, they are all among the nations as a useless vessel. For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up. And the king and princes will soon ride because of the tribute. Hosea prophesies that Israel will not only be completely conquered, but that it would become a part of Assyria, having none of its own identity. This is where it's talking about they have gone up to Assyria. They've been swallowed. They're among the nations. They don't even know who they are. Normally, when a country is conquered, they become a vassal. That's what Rome did with Galilee and Judea. That was a vassal state in which Herod went and controlled that for Rome. So we see that. But here it says they're going to be gone. And because that attempted use of foreign governments to help them, even the king and the princes would be subjected. Remember, the king and the princes tried to negotiate deals with Assyria and then with Egypt. And remember, it all backfired on them and they end up getting wiped out completely when they no longer could pay the extremely high tributes that were being demanded, and they started putting the people into it. Verse 11, because Ephraim has multiplied altars for sinning, they have become to him altars for sinning. Not only were there just two calves that were originally created by Jeroboam so the people wouldn't go down to go up to Jerusalem to worship, here, it's he, Hosea is saying, look, you're making, making, you're not only are you originally transgressing, now you're uh, adding to that transgression by making even more altars. Here God makes it clear, not only were they worshiping at the two calves set up, but they actually put up additional idols worship. And verse 12, when I write for him my laws by the 10,000s, they'd be regarded as a strange thing. God kept sending prophets and the people continued to ignore the warnings. But their words elicit no response and inspire no inspiration, no repentance. And remember, in the king, the days of King Hosea, the discovery of a Torah scroll was considered something out of the ordinary. They were supposed to be reading from that Torah weekly. But it had gone out of meaning to the point that when Hosea found it, they were, it was, it was an amazing thing. And we look at Ezra, if we look at the, the prophet, I mean, the, the scribe Ezra, when he found the temple scroll and he read from it, obviously they'd quit doing the, the weekly worship and studying it. So no matter how many times they were given the word of God, they disregarded it. Hosea 8, verse 13. For my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meal, meat and eat. But the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sin. They shall return to Egypt. This is an interesting statement because it says, as for my sacrificial meal offerings, where do those, those had to take place in the temple. God is addressing Judah, who eventually followed the wicked ways of the ten tribes, relied upon the merit of their sacrifices in the temple to protect them from punishment. Just because they were making the offerings, just because they were asking for atonement. If you ask for atonement and then you go back and do the same thing all over again, you're no better than if you had not even made the sacrifice for atonement because you're walking right back into it. And that's what Hosea 8.13 is talking about. And when we, we move to 14, 
For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. So I will send fire upon the cities, and it shall devour her strongholds. The people of the nation of Israel have forgotten the Almighty who elevated them and glorified them. They have built great fortifications for protection rather than placing their faith in the Almighty. They went out to other countries and asked for help rather than relying on God. They appointed kings and princes who were not appointed by God. However, all their efforts will be to no avail as God will send against them an enemy who will conquer their land, burn their palaces, and eventually even the Holy Temple, which obviously burned was burned down twice, destroyed twice. So Hosea 8 is about this whole, what is going to happen to them because of their actions. And Hosea 9 continues this in verse 1. Rejoice not, O Israel, exalt not like the peoples, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God, you have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. This really is a twofold statement. First, that God blessed them with a fresh threshing floor full of grain, and they yet gave it away in idol worship, or they gave it away in payment to other countries. David, for- what is it with the with the sex and the threshing floors anyway? Okay, so here we go, but here we go back to idol worship. And if you remember, they had temple prostitutes. You paid a fee, you you gave an offering to the temple which then allowed you to have sex with this person. And by having sex with this person, your evil deeds are done away with. That's how temple prostitution works. Pretty good, I think. Plan if you're a guy and you don't care about God. I mean, that's what that's what it talks about. So this is what, what Hosea is saying. You have done these things. You have involved in idol worship. It's not just the calves. It's the fact that you involved in temple prostitution. You gave your fee to the temple and you had sex with the temple. Uh, uh, what did they call him? The exact name was. Well, Priestess. they were temple prostitutes, but they actually had a name. Priest, some of them were priestesses. priestesses. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Temple priestesses. And you had sex with it. Second, they worship idols there on the fresh threshing houses. This is another thing that the that the children of Israel did. They actually set up idols in the threshing houses in the belief that those gods, the gods who dwelt there, would cause prosperity. So God's saying, look, you not only have played the whore and you love to prostitute's wages, the money from the grain, you have set up idols against what is going on. Um, If you have lots and lots and lots of sex, You should be producing lots and lots and lots of children. And so you were giving the gods the right idea so the gods would know what to do. You were teaching the gods how to make lots of stuff. Lots of grain, lots of calves, lots of lambs. You have to show the gods how to do it right. So you do lots of it. And you do it in a public place so the gods can see it. Right. Exactly. And that's the whole thing with temple prostitution. The threshing floor and the vat wine vat shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail them. Now, people ask, well, how do you know it was wine or is it wine? Well, this was grape juice because on a in a in a wine vat, until it ferments, it is still grape juice. And we're talking about in the the new wine where they're crushing it. God is stating here that they will not even acknowledge that he is the one who gives them food and wine. And they've abandoned the service, instead worshiping to false gods. And the grain and the grapes will spoil before they have a chance to use them. That is his curse that he has given onto them. That you don't even follow what I say to do. And you expect to be of a benefit out of it. These idols don't do anything for you. I've given you the grain. And since you don't want to follow through, I'm going to make it fall back. Verse 3, they shall not remain in the land of the, of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat on clean food in Assyria. Now, this is interesting, because remember, in Exodus 14, 13, Moses said, 
to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. So Hosea obviously knows the Torah very, very well because he recalls if the people follow God, they will never see Egypt again. But in Deuteronomy 28, 68, it says, if you do not obey the face of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, and the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt a journey that I promise that you should never make again. So here is, is Hosea reminding them that, look, if you just follow God, you would never go back there because he made that promise to us. Moses made that statement. Fear, God will not send you back. But here is also the curse of that sight. They shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord and their sacrifice shall not please him. It shall be like mourner's bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be of their hunger only. It shall not come to the house of the Lord. Now here it's using the specific phrase, phrase, the house of the Lord. This is obviously a discussion about the temple in Jerusalem. Here Hosea again is addressing the people of Judah, as that is where the temple stood. The fact they offered sacrifices did not matter if they continued to break the other commandments. So you have a dual discussion going on to the people of Israel, but also knowing that the people of Judah would hear about this and hear this warning. Hosea 9 5, what will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? God is asking them, how are they going to worship him? if they no longer have the temple in Jerusalem. He was being very plain about it, right? If you don't follow me, there won't be a temple. Then you cannot follow the appointed festivals. Verse 6, For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt will gather them. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their precious things of silver. Thorns shall be in their tents. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad because of your great iniquity and great hatred. So God is, is continuing telling them what is going to happen from this happen. The prophet is a watchman of Ephraim, obviously not a prophet of God with my God, yet a fowler snare is on all his ways and hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves in the days of Gabeah. He will remember their iniquity and he will punish their sin. Go ahead. Chapter okay. 9, chapter 9, 9. You got to be valid. Sure. Is the conclusion of the curses that are going to come upon Israel and that are later slated to come upon Judah. When we look at these things, if you have a prophet, even a prophet that sometimes tells the truth, but then they go back to their old ways, then they will fall away and will no longer have the blessing of God. And that's what he's talking about. Charles, You know, when he says, my house will be a house of prayer, it seems that they had also lost their ability to be a witness. So it wasn't just for Israel, but also for the surrounding nation couldn't have connection with God either. Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. And what Israel was doing was demonstrating the fact that, uh, uh, that idolatry was the path. They followed the path of idolatry all the way to their destruction. To the fact that they no longer exist anywhere in the world. Uh, but Judah held on for a little longer. But even they fell into the same trap. They fell into the trap on the other side of it. Saying, well, look, we're doing the things that God says. But they're not following what he said in the way that. It seems to me that, that this is a normal human um, aspect 
you know, it's it's the Catholic Church accepted other people's um, worship of, of their own gods wherever they happen to go in the world because uh, they could get them to go to church. So they go to church, then they go and worship their own gods. Yep. Um, and, and it's the same thing that, you know, humans have been doing for a long time. Absolutely. We, we see this cycle repeated over and over and over. And, and we know that at some point the cycle will end. Start, uh, Gordon will continue on next week, starting at 9-9. And he, we are going to start exploring the, the flip side of all this stuff we've been talking about and the coming Messiah. So with that, I will close. And I want to thank you guys for being here today. Our dear loving thank Heavenly you. Father, I want to thank you for all that you've done for us, of the warnings you give us over and over again, even though we should once should be enough. We know that you know we take more than one Lord lesson to learn. And so we thank you for your grace and for your son Yeshua and everything that has been done for us. In the name of your son, amen.